Okay guys, welcome to new episode of JDM Masters. Today, I'm going to review this awesome JDM AF FD2. What's what's going on? Huh? Oh, uh, God. this is, this, um, uh, <laughs> So today on JDM Masters car review, we have a four-door Civic Type R FD2. Hi guys and welcome to another episode of JDM Masters Car Reviews and today we have a four-door Honda Civic. Now it looks like a normal four-door Honda Civic but you see the red badge and the white wheels and that sticker on the side over there. Yes, this is a genuine Type R model. In fact, this is a true JDM model and we're going to tell you why so come join us. Now, a lot of you may be wondering, what is just so special about this four-door Civic Type R? So, this is based on the FD model, which was released in 2005 in Japan. Uh, of course, the same body model was released worldwide. And this follows up from the EP3, which was the second generation model, which was made and designed up in the UK. Made in UK and actually reverse imported. So, the first Civic Type R, known as the EK9, was a completely made in Japan JDM model. Third one, Honda actually went two ways. They had a FN2, which was released in Europe as a hatchback. But that car was a little bit of a disappointment according to reviewers during that time. As it was a little bit heavier, it only had one horsepower increase. What? And in fact, that chassis was based on the Honda Fit from the second generation to the third generation. However, this FD2 Civic Type R is a 100% designed and made in Japan. So therefore, it's also the last true JDM Honda Civic Type R. And it is also the last Type R to use the naturally aspirated K20A high revving VTEC engine. So let's have a look at the details. Now, traditionally, the Honda Civic in Japan has always been within 1,700 millimeters of width to fall into the five number category, which was kept until the ESEP model. So a little explanation. After the EK Civic, the next model, so the EP3 was a hatchback released in the UK and in Japan, they had two models which were the base models of that EP3. It was called the EU for the five-door hatchback and the ES for the four-door sedan, which they also still called Ferial. That was still within the five-number narrow dimension, still a compact car. For the 2005 FD generation, the width has grown into a three-number. In fact, it's about 1,740 millimeters, and it's gone a lot longer. In fact, bringing it close to the category of the Honda Accord. It's still a lot shorter at 4,550 um, milliliters in length. But for a Civic, um, it is pretty big. At least for me, it is. Um, I felt at first, when it, this car was released in 2007, like how, how could such a big body car, which became a four-door sedan, you know, be faster and beat the previous car? Now, the FN2 was actually shown and released before the JDM FD2. So let's have a look. Some of these special design features are this A pillar, which comes very, very extends very far into the bonnet line. In fact, if you look at the, where the front door crease comes down, the front of the A pillar actually forms a strong triangle, giving it a very high aerodynamic shape. And it comes out, you see that the top of the 
windscreen is almost flat with the roof line. In fact, the roof line is kind of curved much more than the previous model, which gives it a really big and wide front windscreen size. In fact, I would say it looks very close to the Honda Odyssey of that generation shown over here. And also the bonnet line becomes extremely short. So what is the purpose that Honda wanted to do this? Perhaps that was the thinking in 2005 for superior aerodynamics and to make it a more slippery shape. But let's continue on to the back. As the car is longer, the roof line is actually a lot longer than the previous model and it gently slopes down again, connecting with the rear windscreen at almost the same angle, going down into a very short boot lid and this kind of gives it a very stubby, a very short rear overhang. And coming down here, the bumper is actually, if you see from this side, it's kind of curved much more than the previous model. There's some design features here that the boot lid is angled downwards and it's kind of like a concave curve. And all these lines are very natural. Looking at it today, it doesn't feel dated at all. And of course, being a four-door saloon and being a top performance model, they gave it a really big wing. Um, looking at this wing, one would think that it's something that would be present on a Lancer Evolution 7 or 8 or 9 or even the WX STI. But the black insert part here, this is also plastic. This would have been nicer if there was a carbon fiber option, but one was never offered. However, taking from the aerodynamic thinking of GT cars, during that time, the center part is a little bit raised down here and as well as the shape being inside the boot line, as you can see, it's more angled inwards. So it looks very, very similar to uh, something on the Lancer Evolution 8 and 9. Body itself has a very wide stance, uh, giving it the base model uh, extended wheelbase. It's gone up from 2,620 millimeters to 2,700. Something interesting about Honda Civics, each generation compared to their peers or their rival cars, they always had one of the longest wheelbases in that category. It was the same with the EG, it was the same with the EK, and for the FD generation, a lot longer than the uh, Mazda 3 or the Toyota Corolla. In fact, the Toyota Corolla was interesting. It was the only car that still remained in the five number category. All other rivals, including the Lancer, had gone wider. And the reason for this, the Japanese makers wanted to appeal more to the Western market, especially America and Europe, where the demands for a larger body, more interior space and more stability for highway cruising in order to rival German cars and other European contemporaries. So this is the reason why the body was growing so big. So obviously, High performance racing cars have to be derived from a base model. The base model was created, um, as I said, it couldn't be helped, but Honda had improved a lot of the body stiffening already for the base model and it provided a very good base for the highest performance model, the Type R. So the long wheelbase obviously made more space in the interior, especially in the rear passenger space. More leg room, more floor room, and you can even see that the windows itself. Um, very long and it kind of extends as wide as possible into the C pillar but it's a nice curve that comes into the lower sill and of course this is a type R side skirt um, and now it's gone from lift up door handles to more European style and this is the kind of trend like pull out door handles but of interest also is the, the side mirrors or the wing mirrors which is now attached to the door uh, such was the trend back then, but also it was not possible to attach it to the body. It was a third three-quarter glass over here, and there's the reason for this. So the, if you open the door, you can see that the A-pillar actually comes into a triangle. So this right here gives high rigidity to the body shell. And um, typical of cars made during the mid-2000s, the A-pillar itself is really, really thick. Now, at first glance, if it didn't have the rear wing, you'll be forgiven for thinking that this is just a normal Honda Civic. But if you look carefully, the front bumper angle is different from the standard model. The standard model kind of goes this way, and 
It has a more purposeful aerodynamic shape here uh, to mimic a front spoiler. So it's kind of integrated instead of a paste-on like compared to the previous models. And the grille is also of a different design. And now you've got the really huge red emblem that signifies as a Type R. And this dark chrome here kind of gives it a little more classy accent. It's kind of a more mature um, Honda Civic Type R. But despite its very sedate and civil looking design, the actual performance of this car is far from that. Now on the rear, it's really simple. The only telltale signs besides the wing are the red emblem and the word Type R here, which is now in black. The shape and the design of the R itself has gone from a curve to more sort of straight cut design. But the difference is very subtle. And if you can look here, the inside of this is octagonal. Now this is the late facelift model, also known as Kogi in Japan. The Zenki model, as you can see in this file photo, has round light instead. So this is really the only way to tell that uh, it's a pre or post facelift. Under here on the rear bumper is a very interesting looking uh, rear diffuser. It's not a full rear diffuser because it doesn't have the plates or uh, going underneath the car, but this design here is meant to direct air uh, through these little vents. So this is a Type R exclusive bumper. Now one thing that's not standard with the car is this Type R sticker, which was a factory option. We just added it uh, when the owner got the car, as you can see here. So look, it fits perfectly. Yeah, there we go. That's first purse, bro. First, 50 hertz first. Um, it's interesting because I suppose Honda wanted to make it a little bit more subtle, but for those who wanted that old school look, no, we have the stickers. So, you know, more horsepower right there. Now, exteriorly, the other point that signifies that this is a tire power, you've got these huge, massive 18 inch wheels. Now, the tire size is 225-40R18. This is really big. Uh, the EP3 had 17 inch wheels, the DC298 had 16, and the EK9 had 15. So it just kept going bigger and bigger um, with each generation. I think the FK8 has like got 20 inch wheels now. I, I couldn't imagine a Type R being so, having such huge wheels. But anyway, also upgraded were the Brembo brakes, which are slightly bigger than the DC5, which is the Type R before this. And it can only fit in these 18 inch. When the owner bought this car, it's got Dunlop uh, Star Spec one, which is a little bit old. But there's a secret recipe why this car handled really well from the factory. And I've got the catalog here, FD2 when it was new. So you can see there. This is the stock tire that was available when the car was new. It is a Potenza RE070, which is a very special compound. It's actually very aggressive, somewhere between um, the highest grade RE71 and very close to a semi slick. In fact, this tire was specially developed for the NA2 NSX Type R. So they carried over that developed OEM tire and put it a standard equipment on this, which gave it you know, really good handling abilities. In fact, the suspension and the geometry is set up uh, according to these tires. So that's something very interesting. To get these tires, you have to actually go to the Honda dealer in Japan, and they're really expensive. So probably no one does that right now. Here's a diagram of the brakes. You can see how much larger it is from the previous model, 320 millimeters in diameter and also to help cooling there is a vent which goes in from the front side of the bumper and goes to the cooling of the back of the brakes. Now what makes a Type R special is actually the body shell. Now I know there are a lot of enthusiasts around the world who probably try to take their base model and this is especially very popular with the EK, uh, take their base model EK2, EK3 and throw in all the exterior parts, the seats, even the engine and the transmission but unfortunately it will never be a real Type R. The reason is this, the body shell is taken from the factory, out of the factory line and reinforced, spot welded in various strategic places and they've done the same with the EP3 and of course even more for the FD2. And let's have a look at the diagram over here. So you have the body in white which means it's just the bare body shell, the strong triangle point and over here it's very extensive and it lists all of the special body welding, seam welding, all the reinforcements done to the actual body shell. It lists down here on this side all of the additions and on this side it lists down the things that they've removed to save weight from the car. Now one of the Type R formula is to strengthen the body but also to lighten the car. Now car enthusiasts will know that a lighter car 
will handle better and have better acceleration. So um, obviously the engine is an NA, and they've increased the power a lot more than the base engine. So this is the type of formula. Decrease the body weight, increase the rigidity to make it handle better, make the engine finely tuned with more higher horsepower and equip it with very good balance. And that's how it can handle very well on the circuits. In fact, from the marketing material here, you can see very clearly they advertise how the Civic Type R or any Type R was born in the circuits. And this is very true. Now, again, back a little bit of the history. Why, why did Honda decide to make a Type R from the NSX formula? So the NSX was actually regarded as more of like a luxury supercar. But in order to achieve Honda's uh, goal of making it a really good handling sport. So they created the NSXR. That was expensive, so people couldn't afford that. And then they came up with the DC2, and then the EK9, which was something that people could afford. And they carried on that particular generation in order for it to also to participate in racing. Now, to, to participate in one make racing, which actually they did sell such a car before. Here it is. This is the Civic One Make race car, which can't be registered on the road. And it was even a price here. I have the price list from in 2008. Without anything, no interior, no options, absolutely nothing, 1.6 million yen compared to the road model, which was priced at 2.8 million yen and with the full options, 3 million yen. Quite a big difference. But that was the intention that people could buy these cars and participate in the one make race or even the Super Taikyu. So imagine having a car so sharp, it was literally like driving a racing car on the streets, but you had air, you have aircon, you have HID lights, uh, comfortable seat, you have all the amenities of uh, a normal road car. So that's what it is. And there's many things about it that shouldn't be touched. And let's touch on that a little bit. So inside here is the McPherson strut suspension, which was carried over and improved from the previous EP3 model, but radically different from the previous B engine series generation, the EK9, the DC, and the EG. Now, having a strut suspension makes it very difficult to get the geometry right. In fact, the EP3 had several problems with the handling, having the steering mechanism very high up. Now, they went back to a conventional low-mounted steering mechanism in the FD2. As you can see here, this is the diagram of the front suspension. And you have a conventional strut over here. But here, it lists out all the parts that they have also reinforced. Now the rear suspension is still a double wishbone, but it's of a completely different design. What Honda have done is increase the stiffness of the bushes, which contributes to this very sharp handling. So stuff that you can't really see. And the subframe itself also, uh, back then, was a revolutionary uh, technique of stiffening the parts of the of the subframe to the body without increasing weight. They actually used a very strong industrial strength adhesive, yes, glue, um, not just rivets and not just welding. Using glue uh, decreased the weight. So those are kind of technologies that they used back then, which wasn't really attempted by m a lot of makers. So the suspension spring rate and the damping rate uh, was thoroughly researched. And as you can see here, uh, this is the special Type R ones. From the base model, the Type R has 1.25 times more stiffness in the, in the front and in the rear, 1.6 times more, which means that the rear spring rate is actually a little bit uh, harder than the front. Now, this is, of course, natural because the rear uses a double wishbone. And if you look carefully here, I want you to draw your attention to they've separated the springs and the dampers, and it's not a coil over. So the, so the actual uh, spring movement is away from the mounting point of the hubs, which on the McPherson struts is directly, directly on the hub. So the a double wishbone suspension has always it offset a little bit, which means the rear needs to be stiffer. And the Type R actually handles in such a way that the rear, even though it's a front-wheel drive car, the rear just helps the car to rotate around the front. So driving it makes it feel like it's really grippy, it's on rails, a little bit sometimes like an FR car. Uh, depending on where you are in the corner, coming out like a four-wheel drive car. 100% stock was already very good for the circuit and definitely uh, very good handling. And you can see here, on, uh, this catalog shows it on the Paul Ricard circuit in France. 
Um, as it is uh, in testing, you can see here in our best motoring reference videos how the FD2 Civic Type R in 2007, when it was released, actually gained a faster time than the R34 GTR, almost as close as the NSX Type R. Now that's amazing, a four-door sedan with a two-liter NA engine, which we're gonna talk about next. What are the things that they've done to the engine? Okay. So, the bonnet, we're gonna open it. It's really light because it's much shorter and smaller than the previous model, uh, especially compared to the EK9. Now, here we are, this is the K20 engine, which is a four-cylinder, two-liter, twin-cam, DOHC VTEC, but it's also got this special eye here for intelligent. The K20A is a renowned engine, especially now, um, very favored and loved by tuners, especially in America, for high boost applications, uh, engine swaps to even older models. But let's today look at K20A in its native chassis, and being the FD2 being the last of the K20A iterations, how much of it is improved over the previous model? Okay, so let's just go back into the K20 engine uh, development over the previous B18C and B16B. Here is a whole diagram of the K20 engine with the flywheel and the throttle body. It's a bit different from the B series engine and it's got actually closer uh, relation to the F20C engine found in the Honda S2000 which we explained in review in our previous video, you can see over here. So it is a four cylinder two liter, but the S2000's F20C is a short stroke, meaning the bore is bigger than the stroke, so giving it a very high revability. The F20C was the other way around, uh, it was actually a long stroke. The K28 is actually in between, it. it's square, it's 86 multiplied by 86, which means the bore and stroke are the same. Um, this makes it actually the same dimensions as the 3S GE engine found in the Toyotas and the SR20 found in the Silvia. What are the advantages of Born Stroke? It's a balance between power and torque. But the Honda engine could still rev past 8,200 RPM with the addition of variable cam phasing timing attached to the intake valve. It was able to improve on the mid-range torque and the low end response, giving it actually more drivability, especially around city speeds, than the f 20 c the Honda S2000. The weight of the car, is, the S2000 is slightly lighter, maybe about 30 kilograms, but driving this with the short gear ratios really feels much easier and more torquey to drive, which is why it's such a great engine. Now, the K2A was also unique, or not so unique, actually, that was used in a lot of other models, the CRV, uh, the Odyssey, and Stream, all the other models. But for the Type R engine, which is accentuated by the red head. Of course, Honda has handled everything, balance parts, uh, the piston, the crankshaft, the con rods, all hand-built um, and torque to specification. But what they've done with the cylinder head, if you, I can direct your attention to, this is a little explanation of the intake port, which you can see here, it's very rough, and the engineers have actually used, um, they've hand-ported it and made it smooth. On the previous B18C Type R and the B16B, they were doing it by hand. Um, but this new process, which they've developed for the only the FD2, comes from the same process that they use in the NSX Type R and A2. It's like a, it's like a coating plus uh, a little bit of uh, porting as well. So the reason to do this is to increase the velocity of airflow especially at higher engine speeds. It's not a known secret that in order for an NA engine to produce high horsepower, it needs to rev higher, but also it needs a better breathing. High flow through the intake ports with stronger pistons and that Honda precision in keeping the compression for each cylinder with the settings of the cams. The k 20 now delivered 225 horsepower, five horsepower increase over the DC5 doesn't seem like much, uh, no, barely one kilogram of, of torque, but it feels very, very strong, now, much stronger than the previous model, even though the car is actually almost 70 kilograms heavier. It's funny that a lot of independent tests have done after the engine was running properly, they actually produced in excess of 230. Now, one more thing that 
is maybe a little bit of a disadvantage with having the A pillar so far. The engine is now half hidden inside uh, this really high firewall roof. You could probably make it access to the uh, spark plugs and the plug coils a little bit difficult. In fact, looking at this, there's not much space. It looks like it's really hard to do a lot of maintenance. But um, if you're a good mechanic, you'll probably find your way around it. Steering pump, that's really huge. Um, whereas the EP3 and a lot of cars in that time have used electric power steering. So, electric power steering is good because it doesn't rob horsepower from the engine, but maybe it decreases feels when you're going in the corner. So for some reason, Honda's decided to stick to the hy traditional hydraulic power steering in the FD2 that increased power um, differently. Another thing to note about this engine compared to the previous B engine models is that the intake is on the front and the exhaust is facing the back, which means they're also able to lower the engine slightly. Another point to note in the engine bay, the, this is where the ECU actually sits. Uh, a lot of cars, Pulse 2000s, have the ECU sitting in here. On the FD2, it's not such a big problem with heat, uh, but it was a, it's a much bigger problem on the later FK2 and FK8 models because the turbocharged engine creates so much heat, um, it just affects the ECU. So maybe it's for, you know, um, modular system of arranging parts and also the wire harness that they put the ECU inside here. There's a lot of electronics. I don't know. <laughs> Before we check out the interior, I want to show you the catalog. Here it shows the standard red against the black and it's beautiful contrast because you have the carpets that are red, the center of the front seats and the rear seats that are red. But because it was a four-door center, maybe they wanted to give it a more sedate choice for some people and they had a choice between red or full black and this car is actually full black. Let's have a look at the interior though. First of all, being a four-door sedan, I'm gonna sit in the rear seats and, oh, this is a, such a big difference from the previous model, the 2,700 millimeter wheelbase definitely um, makes rear passenger is much more complex. You can see how much space I have here. Although the seats are a little bit stiff and you have this very nice Type R exclusive kind of ultra suede in the center and the pinch holes. Um, of course, the optional red, as you can see here, um, depending on your taste, I kind of like the black, it's more subdued with, it makes the red stitching stand out quite a lot more. Um, but lumbar support, for a Civic class is much improved from the previous models. You have a little headrest, a lot of headroom here. And even on the side, the trim is the same pinhole trim as the seats on, on the side. The door handles are of a very interesting shape. You kind of put your two fingers in here and they're very easy to get out. Hmm. What's missing is a center armrest and you can see how bulge this thing is. In fact, I suspect this is actually a four-seater car. And this is taking cues from the Honda Civic EG9 Ferrier, which is a true bucket seat, two-seater in the rear. So I've got my seatbelt on. There's another one for the right passenger and there's no center um, seat, seat belt. So yeah, no one can sit in the center. It's a four-seater car. Doesn't matter. Now, another feature that's very interesting on the FD Civic, which was also used on the previous ES, is a very low center tunnel, which is usually quite high, even on the FF car. Um, this makes it a lot more roomy. Um, so you can probably put your bag here. Uh, it just gives a lot of space. Another interesting thing also is huge door pockets for the rear passenger. This is probably big enough to fit um, a pet bottle or, or, a, or a can of cola. Much more utility. Let's go to the front. Okay, so we're now in the front seat. The first impression I get is just how far the front windscreen is compared to the previous model. Obviously accentuated by the thick A pillars, which probably makes it a little bit tricky uh, to do tight corners because the line of vision is probably blocked by the far A pillars here, which is why there's probably a window in the, over here, a triangle window, kind of like 
peek around the corner, I don't know. Uh, but this is the feature of the FD generation. Uh, it just looks so space age now. Here's the key, which is a Type R exclusive key. See, it's got the uh, Honda red emblem. And I'm gonna put it in, turn, turn it, nothing happens. You have to press this engine start button. So clutch in and start. So this is actually a two-tier design. Now Honda experimented with this design simply because they thought that it would be very interesting and perhaps also safe for the driver to have the most important uh, displays like the speed and the fuel gauge right at the edge of the horizon of your eyesight. So when you're looking at the road, all you have to do is just glance very quickly down and you have the most important information and further back closer to you over here, traditionally in the same place as most instrument clusters is the tachometer, you've got the trip meter and the digital water temperature gauge on the left. But what's interesting is that the tachometer, of course you can see the Type R emblem, which signifies uh, its specialty, that it only revs up to 9,000 RPM. On the previous model, uh, on the EK9 also, it, had, it was 10,000 RPM. But I'm really liking that really space age, spaceship design, where it's another way of thinking of being more driver centric, only on this part. In fact, there's quite a lot of space here. I can put things. There's, uh, Mugen actually has a optional meters which, which can be put on here, but uh, it's almost like a table. But they try to uh, make it less so by putting some deep angles and curves over here, but it doesn't you know, detract from the fact that it's quite far forward. Another interesting thing, let's operate the windshield wipers. Can you see? It's a scissor type. It's like a bus. But the mechanism is so clever that it never hits it. It comes very close. The reason for this is that because the windscreen is so big. Factory option Honda HDD Inter-Navi system, um, which in Japan, they have this service called the Premium Club Navi, which gives you access to um, the operator. Uh, Toyota also has this system. It's very intelligent. You pay a small fee a month for the Premium Club, and you can get online help for directions, uh, suggestions, even emergency calls. And it's quite rare to find this option because it was pretty expensive. There are controls here as well on this on the steering wheel. A little note about the steering wheel, very different from the previous model, which used Momo uh, up to the EP3. Now, this is a normal Honda steering wheel, very small in diameter, just like the DC5. But the grip, I feel that it's a little bit less in thickness than the previous model but nevertheless it's very nice to hold for the fd2 model uh, they've also included rake and reach so a lot more adjustability uh, depending on your height i'm 178 centimeters tall and sitting in the lowest position of this seat which can be adjusted for height by the way it feels immediately a lot higher than the dc5 or definitely a lot higher than the ek9 but because the body line is so high, the placing of the pedals is also quite optimum. The gear shift here, I don't feel that it's very different from uh, the previous models. In fact, the driving position is pretty good. It's good enough um, to as, as a base race car. Let's look at the pedals. Different from the previous model is the organ type, uh, which was used a lot on European cars. Quite tricky to do heel and toe, but because they've made this part here, the lower part a lot wider, and uh, these aluminium pedals are come standard, it's actually not that difficult to do heel and toe. Uh, some like the organ pedal, some like the, the, the normal standing type. Digital aircon integrated into the buttons. Very nice, high quality plastics uh, compared to their peers. Very different from the previous models. After the EP3 was very useful with the, uh, the cubby space. But the FD2 goes a step further. There's a lot of space here um, being based on the normal model. Deep holes and spaces for putting things. You put your keys here. Right next to the gear shift, which actually makes it very convenient. But then the, look at this interesting swan neck design. It's completely integrated into the space of 
the gear shift position, which gives you huge space over here. There's even more space here. And this is very interesting. So you've got a lid, it opens up, and this is how you press the buttons and you can put two cups and you can even put your snacks on the side. There's even more space here. Usual deep hole, cubby box to put CDs or tissue papers or, or, or whatever. Yeah, and it slides forward and you've got an armrest. This is utility, that's something I really appreciate. Uh, map reading lamps, uh, which not a, were not available on the DC2 and the e that they removed that uh, to lighten the car. Now the Type R's up to EP3 and DC5, the EK9 had OEM Recaro seats. But you look at this, there's no Recaro word anywhere because it was actually not made by Recaro, not supplied by Recaro. It's actually a Honda OEM seat, which means it's lost the infinite reclining dial on the side. But you have a lever, which can make it function like a normal um, seat. But amazingly, the shape looks like Recaro. And it's been said by insiders that Honda actually cooperated with Recaro Japan to design the shape. Absolutely no complaints about um, the hold. Supporters could be a little bit stiffer, but you can always change it to a, a bucket seat, but really no complaints at all. What I like is I can just relax like this, wait for whoever I'm going to pick up while waiting at the station, whereas in my car, I just, I, I wouldn't move my my position at all because I've, I've, I've put the dial in a particular position. So I'm really liking that. Another thing that's different is the gear shift knob itself. Um, already on the previous model, it was made with nice aluminium and there's shifter uh, as a ball and it's a really short throw. You know, this car is equipped with Mugen short shifter mechanism and the bushings and it just makes the shifter feel very positive, very much like uh, the, an S1000, it's quite close actually, like close to an NSX. It doesn't have that traditional cable kind of notchy feeling at all. So overall, the interior is a very nice place to be despite it being a very hardcore uh, performance car. Now lastly, if you have a four-door sedan, obviously boot or trunk space is very, very important. The short stubby trunk lid means that the actual opening is very, looks very small, but it's deep. Look at all this stuff that we've managed to put in here. Masa has got his uh, Mugen stuff. I've got my books. I've got this, Legends Media. Thank you, Dustin, and more stuff. Um, nothing different from the standard model. There's a lot of space. You can put two golf bags. Uh, functions completely as a normal family car. So it's a great balance between utility and sport. Hey guys, it's me, Masa here. And actually, this is my new car. Can't believe it, I just bought an FD2 Type R, you know? But anyway, I bought this car because it's the last true JDM. In like a lot of, you know, videos like best motoring and all those other stuff, I, when I was a kid at the time, I couldn't have driver's license. To cheer us and everybody placed this car as a really, really real Type R. Because previous EP3 wasn't kind of like, you know, softer in a way, but this is a really hardcore car, so I just really needed to have it. And after, right after I just bought this car, I drove it, it felt really, really smooth on a, you know, the K20 engine's natural, you know, naturally aspirated engine, it felt really smooth. When it hits VTEC, it really, it, well, like in Ken says, really switches over, but it, for me, it kicks in, you know, it goes really, get us, get up, get up and goes. Yeah, it's like, it's like that. So that's why I bought this car as a, a real JDM. Like I wanted to drive the real JDM car, so I just bought this. Oh, by the way, guys, I'm gonna start a YouTube channel. So yay! So like, follow me if you want to see my personal experience of this FT2 Type R, and also my journey as a new um, graduate student who started, you know, life and outside of, you know, my comfort zone. And yeah, thanks for watching guys. And thank you JDM Masters for reviewing my FD2. So guys, that was a review of the JDM Honda Civic Type R FD2. And we hope you liked that video. Uh, let us know in the comments if you like us to review other kind of cars, maybe the previous generation. And until the next time, peace out.